Oh, there you go. Thank you. Well, thanks for the invitation, um, Mike and Wendy. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, Keypoint, which is another trusted research environment. Uh, I think by the third talk, you guys are going to be overwhelmed by talk of trusted research environments or TREs. So, um, look, I'll probably skip a lot of, lot of the information. The five frame, the, f um, the five safes you've heard about, and I guess you, with, through Roger's talk, as well as through Louisa and Matt's talk, you've heard a lot of background about TREs. So I will kind of try to focus specifically around Keypoint a little bit um, and try to call out some of the differences because, um, as noted by Matt and Louisa, there's a few out there and there are subtle differences. And in some ways, Keypoint came about because uh, there was a recognition um, in a project that was funded by Australian Research Data Commons and at the time uh, quite a heavy investment by the Faculty of Medicine at University of Queensland that the existing TREs at, the, at that time, at point in time, weren't exactly what the university wanted and what the research community within the university wanted. So we partnered with the ARDC and, and with the uh, University of Queensland to develop Keypoint. So one of the first things that we, what we want to address with Keypoint is we, we wanted the authentication to be linked to the national system. So Keypoint's authentication is, it's multifactorial authentication, but at its heart is the use of the Australian Access Federation. So if you have an Australian Access Federation login, which most academics have, uh, you can use your uh, existing um, login for your institution. Um, if you are outside of academia and don't have an Australian Access Federation, uh, QCIF certainly has the ability to mint an ID for you uh, for AAF. And in some cases, with some of the projects that I'll talk about a bit later, that is in, indeed the case in that we've minted identi um, identities for people who need access to a particular vault. Uh, the other key element about Keypoint is we are, the computing infrastructure we're using is actually part of Anchorus. So we are using the Nectar Cloud. So we're using what's called a restricted region of the Nectar Cloud. Um, again, our ethos of Keypoint was we didn't want to, we wanted to leverage the existing resources and investment that's done by the Australian public funders from public funds and to leverage that in our system so we don't have to go to you know, Amazon or AWS, but we wanted to uh, essentially leverage those investments that have already happened and build a system around that infrastructure. In this case, it's the a restricted region of the Nectar Cloud. And the other key element here um, for Keypoint is that um, we are already a host of the Nectar Cloud, so we had the support structure of the people, uh, uh, the sysadmins and so on. So we wanted to uh, ensure that this was going to be an efficient and effective uh, TRE so that we can manage at, a, at lowest cost as possible because we were also cognizant of the fact that even in our research ecosystem, there's a challenge around equity, right? I mean, not every institution is large enough that they could you know, they draw on their block grants or other funds to have local support. So we wanted this to be uh, useful to the Australian community much more broadly uh, at, a, at a lower cost base as possible. Actually, before I continue on the, uh, just in terms of the architecture, so one of the other things that we have designed is that uh, once we set up what we call a key point vault, and you can have a number of different vaults. Once we set up a, a singular vault, our role in terms of governance is done. All the other data custodianship and data governance responsibilities fall to the institution. So for example, uh, the data ingress and egress uh, and the different roles and responsibilities you assign and so that the, the we, want, we don't have access to the data. Once the vault is set up, the only thing we do is if you say, we need more resources, we need more CPUs, uh, or we need a temporary need uh, access to a, uh, a GPU cluster, that's the only time we intervene, but we don't see the data. 
For us, it was important um, in the architecture and through that project to design in a way that the roles and responsibilities are very clear about who actually has the data-based roles versus the infrastructure-based roles. Coming back to the infrastructure, Keypoint itself as a product is going through ISO 27001 certification. We've passed stage one, so we're into stage two, so we're hoping by the end of the, end of the year that it'll be certified. Uh, in terms of the infrastructure, the Nectar, as Roger mentioned, is undergoing um, uh, the, the RNet hosted uh, uh, cloud infrastructure is going through ISO certification as well. So I guess our ultimate goal is to deploy both the infrastructure and Keypoint as a product with that ISO 27001 certification. It doesn't speak to all the trust elements we've all talked about already, but it's certainly from a systems point of view, we're hoping that will convey that trust that, that helps with adoption. So a lot of the projects that we currently have are based at UQ, to be honest, because that's where this is kind of grown from. Um, but I think I've listed a few different projects here, but ultimately, Keypoint is just, it's a tool, but ultimately what we're really after is the research translation, right? Getting access to the data and the research translation. So if I were to just pick out two exemplar projects, so the difference project, for example, has allowed Keypoint in the workflow so that we bring um, indigenous maternal health data from uh, a First Nations uh, hospital service and, uh, and uh, Queensland kind of health data and bring it together. First of all, it goes through the data architecture of OMOP and other standards, but then what we have is Keypoint playing a role so you can do the analysis. And as per our previous uh, talks, in the Keypoint environment, it's a, it's a virtual desktop, no copy paste, no internet access, but it has tools, SPSS, Strata and so on, and also it has the ability to bring in your Python scripts and any other um, bespoke code that you want to introduce. Uh, but in this case, the Difference Project facilitated two different organisations bringing their data together to provide some analytics that will have a translation and hopefully uh, a material impact onto the wel welfare and health of our First Nation mothers. The other project is the National um, Infrastructure for Federated Learning uh, in Digital Health. So again, key point is in that archi overall architecture, and this speaks to a little bit about this federated approach. So what we can do is have instances of key point uh, on what's called edge nodes, so that we can send an AI model without moving data into various edge nodes that have instances of key point, and the aggregation is only the model that you, you, you derive. So the model is based on a whole lot of data at different institutions, but the, the aggregation is only the model, so the data doesn't even move. But each of those sites needs to have a trusted research environment. But the interesting point here, though, is that we are actually poking a hole into that trusted research environment in order to send the AI. So I think in talking about moving forward with TREs, or secure research environments for that matter, there is a now um, another further development in this space to leverage AI and machine learning capabilities, which now introduce new topics like, uh, I think Roger mentioned, this idea of data spaces. So data spaces is a sort of European concept, but one of the things about data spaces is also the concept of trusted connectors. So this is how data or models get moved from one trusted environment to another to build these kind of aggregate models. So we are already starting to develop beyond just trusted research environments. The problem is, of course, um, we haven't even fully adopted trusted research environments. So I guess you know, a lot of the conversation has been about risk and cyber risk and so on. These are all important elements, but I do wonder about our sovereign capabilities to actually have material impact on health translation if you can't solve a lot of these trust issues. Here, the governance slide here, this is, illustrates a lot better what I was trying to articulate before. So 
QCIF as a platform operator is we just, like I said, just set it up, but the end user roles and institution data custodian SIPs, the, the, the data agreements, that's all outside of QCIF and it's really up to the institution. So QCIF's agreement is usually with the institution. So we have an agreement to say we will operate this on your behalf, but the agreement very clearly also stipulates the roles and responsibilities and the divide between QCIF as an operator and provider and you as a data, as an institution and your relationship with your, the data custodians that you work with. So I guess at a highest level, the way I would describe it is we are delivering the tool, but the, the bulk of the data custodianship about the rules and systems and processes are set up at the institutional level. I've been really upfront here with the costs. So the hardware cost for us to set up like 20 volt is about, was like just over, what, you know, just over half a million dollars, but it is very constrained resources. So we can only really help we're going to reach a cap pretty soon. Uh, and of course, the resources capital has to be refreshed every three to five years. Um, the software development, it costs us about just over a million dollars in people's time to build it. And we're not done yet, to be honest. It's still a work in progress in some ways. Uh, and the software licenses are not cheap. I mean, anybody who pays for licenses, it took us an exorbitant amount of time to convince SPSS and IBM and others that, you know, you can't charge us for every vault. We're in a virtual desktop environment. So there were other challenges in building this to this stage even. Um, but one thing that we have been able to do is to make it very lean in terms of operating it. So I think we only really need two staff to operate it at the current scale. Now, I know Louis, uh, uh, Matt put up this notion of technical support. Um, in some ways, we treat that differently as projects. So, you know, I have roughly 40 FTE that I can call on for software development or AI projects. Uh, so it's a little bit different in, the, in our model. Um, and the accreditation is going to cost money. The penetration testing that we do every year is going to cost money. But at the nuts and bolts of Keypoint as a product is it costs about twenty-five dollars to $30,000 per vault. That is what, a, what an institution can choose to pay. One vault can hold multiple separated projects. But how you divvy up the vault, what local processes and how you uh, assign those different um, work, uh, if you like, projects within the vault, they're all separated. It's up to the institution. Lessons learned, I think. Um, Everybody has different governance models, and you know we are we answer a lot of questions not to do with the technology. It's all to do with governance. That, and and you know when we when we tell people it's it's up to you how to do the do the governance, we often get us, but how? <laughs> so it's it, I think that's where the challenge is, not the technology. Um, and I think what we've under our biggest challenge is you know I want to personally see uptake and translation, but trying to convince you know, the ecosystem across academia and governments and industry to come to a common understanding of trust has been the most difficult part. I'll end with that, thanks. So we'll, um, thank you very much, Seth. No problem. So we'll go to questions, um, and this is just before we go to a short break, so. I've got a quick question. Quick question. Hi, I'm Nicole Pratt, University of South Australia. Um, thank you for that talk. I hadn't heard of that platform, so it's really um, informative. I think um, you mentioned OMOP and standardisation, and I wonder whether this is a bit of an elephant in the room, um, and whether or not uh, approaches to harmonisation and standardisation of data can actually end up negating the need for at least some projects in requiring TREs. Um, if standardization of data is an approach and that approach then allows analysis to be done by analysts without even accessing the data, then TREs themselves are not always necessary. So I wonder whether 
you know, this is a question mainly for everyone <laughs> and working in TREs, whether there are some cases where in fact TREs aren't totally necessary. Yeah, probably, you're, no doubt you're right. I mean, I, we do work with projects that don't have data standards. Like I do some work with MCRI in Melbourne around allergy-based data and there's no data standards. Very challenging uh, for that just by not having standards or having un inconsistent standards, I would say. You're probably right, but I think, um, you know, in some ways we are an, an, an enabler and we participate in some projects. So uh, my team works on data architectures and the first thing we always ask is, is there a data standard <laughs> in your community? And some, sometimes the answer is yes and sometimes the answer is not sure, not yet, or, you know, and OMOP is great to work with, as is FIRE, but, you know. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. It's um, it's more of an architectural question. So for for all the presenters, so we've seen um, four different architectures, and it's more of a reflection of um, really thinking through what is the problem you're trying to solve, rather than developing a solution looking for a problem. So it, it's just it's just interesting seeing how um, you know from a not not only from a technical perspective, mm -hmm. but what are the business problems you're trying to solve. Um, and how you've designed it, yeah. um, rather than trying to mandate saying this is the solution that we should take. Yeah. yeah, look, I think, let me be clear, TREs by themselves are not the panacea. I mean, they're not going to solve all the, all the challenges we have. Um, I guess the principles that, for key point, was we didn't want to own the, the data governance. We needed that to be institutional specific. As much as possible, we wanted to be you, uh, as broadly applicable in terms of authentication, trust and identity, and, and, and our other principle was we want to be connected with the NCRIS capabilities. Yeah. Money. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we were trying to make it as cheap as possible. I mean, I think I quoted 25 to 30K. We're hoping to make it even cheaper over time based on scale. Yeah. And I think just picking up on your point, when we were trying to organise this session, we kept saying, well, what is the problem we're trying to solve here? And, and the whole group was going around in circles and we said, look, let's just have this and let's learn about TREs, what they are, what they aren't, and what they do solve and what they... And, and we're not getting all those answers today, but that was really something we've all been challenged with. What is the problem we're trying to solve and which is the solution? TREs might solve some things, but obviously there's going to be other solutions for other things. Um, for example, if you're doing a clinical trial and you're trying to report SAEs, you know, completely different thing you need. So. It's only a, p a point in the story, and I think we all need to know that. Yeah. So thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.